got to Chico? asked Werner. She's lurking about somewhere in some other form, no doubt, said Wolfgang. As a toadstool or an owl or some such thing, cackling over the chaos she's caused. Suddenly Wilhelm stood up, his fingers clawing at empty air. In a frightfully clumsy fashion, as if he were deaf, dumb, and blind, he clawed and clambered his way over the side of the Mercedes that had belonged to von Ronstedt. Once out of the car, he took a position about ten feet away from his brothers and sister, turned, and faced them. His eyes stared, every muscle in his body was rigid, the crotch of his trousers bulged. The voice that came out of his mouth was deep, rich, oleaginous, and horrid. There are long accounts to set all children of Gruard. Wolfgang forgot the sounds of battle that raged around him. You! Here! How did you escape? The voice was like crude petroleum seeping through gravel, and like petroleum it was a fossil thing, the voice of a creature that had arisen on the planet when the South Pole was in the Sahara and the great cephalopods were the highest form of life. I took no notice. The geometry ceased to bind me. I came forth. I ate souls, fresh souls, not the miserable plasma you have fed me all these years. Great Gruad! Is that your gratitude? Wolfgang stormed. In a lower voice he said to Werner, Find the talisman. I think it's in the black place, sealed with the seal of Solomon on the eye of Nut. To the being that occupied Wilhelm's body, he said, You come at an opportune time. There will be much killing here and many souls to eat. These around us have no souls. They have only pseudo-life. It sickens me to sense them. Wolfgang laughed. <laughs> Even the Luigar can feel disgust then. I have been sick for many hundreds of years while you kept me sealed in one pentagon after another, feeding me not fresh souls, but those wretched stored essences. We gave you much, cried Werner. Every year, just for you, thirty thousand, forty thousand, fifty thousand deaths in traffic accidents alone. But not fresh, not fresh. Perhaps so. You can settle your debt to me tonight. I sense many lives nearby, lives you have somehow lured here. They can be mine. Werner handed Wolfgang a stick with a silver pentagon at the tip. Wolfgang pointed it at the possessed Wilhelm, who shrieked and fell to his knees. For a moment there was silence, broken only by the sound of Winifred's terrified sobbing and the crack of rifles and the chatter of machine guns in the background. You shall not have those lives, Yog Sothath. They are for the transcendental illumination of our servants. Wait, though, and there shall be lives in plenty for all of us. Werner said. For we parley, our army is destroying itself, and there will be no lives for anyone. Really? said the thick voice. How has your plan gone astray? Let me read you and learn. Wolfgang felt goose pimples break out all over his body. He shuddered as coarse, boneless fingers dripping with slime turned the pages of his mind. Hmm, I see. She is here, then. It would be good to meet her in battle once again. Are your powers equal to hers? said Wolfgang, eagerly. I yield to none, came the proud reply. Ask him why he's always getting trapped in pentagons, then, said Werner in a low voice. Shut up, Wolfgang whispered savagely. To the Luigar, he said, Destroy her golden apple and release my army to move ahead, and I will withhold the power of this pentagon and give you all the lives you seek. Done, said the voice. Wilhelm suddenly threw back his head, mouth wide open. A choking sound came from his throat. He collapsed on his back, spread-eagled. A strange, greenish, glowing gas rose from his throat. Werner jumped from the car and rushed over to Wilhelm. He's alive! 
Of course he's alive, said Wolfgang. The Eater of Souls simply took possession of his body to communicate with us. Winifred screamed. Look! The same phosphorescent gas, a huge cloud of it, now obscured the heart of the battle. It seemed to take a shape like a spider with an uncountable number of legs, arms, antenna, and tentacles. Gradually the shape changed, glowing brighter and brighter. A nearby tower on the festival grounds was as visible in the reflected light as if it were day. Then the glow faded, and the tower was silhouetted in moonlight. A great silence fell over the hills around Lake Totenkopf, broken only by the glad cries of the last contingent of festival-goers as they made it safely to the opposite shore. "'There's no time to lose,' Wolfgang said to Werner and Wilhelm. "'Round up some officers. See if you can find Hanfgeist.' Hanfgeist had disappeared. The highest-ranking officer surviving was Übergruppenführer Bickler, visions of dog turds sadly fading in a mind that possessed only a horrid semblance of life. A quick survey showed the four Illuminati primi that the apple of discord had cost them half their army.